Welcome to the Unconventional Path, entrepreneurship and innovation stories and ideas. Hi, I'm Bela Musitz. Hi, and I'm Mike Wasserman. Today, we're excited to be joined by, by Janice Millam. Janice is the Senior Vice President and Global Brand Leader at Marriott. She is responsible for several of Marriott's brands, including Courtyard, Fairfield, Four Points, Residence Inn, and others. Yeah, Bela, this is a radical idea to have somebody from a big company on, but I loved it because she talked a lot about branding, which I think is really important from, as you know, the hotel industry is all about brand in a lot of ways, and also franchising, because a lot of entrepreneurs um, are franchise owners, and um, it's kind of neat to look at this from the corporate side. So I think let's get right to the interview with Janice Millam. Hello, listeners. Bela Musitz here. Today, I'm here with Janice Millam. Uh, she is the Senior Vice President and Global Brand Leader for Classic Select Brands at Marriott International. Well, you might be asking yourself, what does a person from a large company have to offer to small companies and entrepreneurs? Well, Janice has a wealth of experience in building brands uh, and building brands across several different companies and several different products. So I think uh, she's gonna offer some great uh, insights uh, and uh, the key aspects of building a brand. So welcome to the show, Janice. It's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Sure. My pleasure. So let me ask you a question. If you go to a, a social event, uh, and, and not one that's in your industry, but just sort of, you know, a, a social event, and uh, someone comes up to you and you introduce each other, uh, and then that person asks you, oh, nice to meet you, Janice, and they ask you, what do you do? How do you answer that question? It's a good question. So I usually start by saying um, I work for Marriott International and that I have for the last 30 years and that I've done a lot with the company. But currently my role is to look after seven of our 30 brands um, and I oversee all of the strategy, the product development, the marketing, have a team that, that looks after those seven brands is usually how I would introduce myself as a quick elevator speech. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very nice. That's very good. So, uh, Early in your career, uh, you went to uh, you went to college, and where did you go? I went to the University of Kansas. Okay. Got a degree in uh, School of Journalism, Public Relations, and Advertising. Okay, and what did you do uh, immediately after after college? So right after college, I went to work for Procter and Gamble, and I actually was in sales. So I had a small territory in Kansas City, and I basically had the very um, sexy job of selling toilet paper and um, bounty paper towels and pampers. Okay. And those were predominantly to uh, other businesses, right? You're, so you're selling to grocery chains, et cetera. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so what was sort of the, the main thing that you learned from that experience? I learned that I don't like working from home. I learned that I am better in an environment where I can um, be around people and because this was largely, you know, my, that that was my scenario. I also learned something that, that my boss told me um, at that time that I've always taken with me is I thought at about a year I was ready to be promoted. And I was um, and I asked her about that because I'd mastered, I thought, the, the job. And she said, Janice, when you master a job is probably about the time when you should really hunker in for another six months to kind of get your master's degree in that job. So you've sort of gotten your bachelor's degree in the job, but really take the time to perfect it. And I thought that was really wise. I didn't really like the message at the time, but I thought it was a really um, good piece of advice. Yeah, yeah, that is. I haven't heard anyone else articulate it that way. And, and that is a great piece of advice because it's really an opportunity to hone your skills, not just to figure out what your skills are, right? Because for the absolutely, that's exactly it. Yeah. The first year you're just figuring out like, okay, how do I get stuff done? How do I do it? And uh, it's interesting in that if I reflect back on my career, uh, and my wife constantly reminds me of this, I I'm sort of on a three year cycle. So like, you know, the first year I found, I find really, really interesting. The second year is really good. And then by the third year of being in a position, I'm getting bored and it, you know, it's time for me to go, you know, find a new challenge uh, intellectually for me. So very interesting. That sounds about right to me. That's kind of the three year cycle is what I tell people too, when they get into a job, it really about three years is what you need to plan on. And then, then it's probably time to think about something else. So yeah. I agree with that. So we have a lot of young listeners on this show, and, and one of the things that, that people often struggle with is when they finish their university experience, 
you know, do they go to work for a large company? Do they maybe start their own business? Do they join the family business if they have that opportunity? Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I have a 20 year old, she's in college and um, she's very clear on what she wants to do. She wants to be an in interior design um, architecture, um, um, do that in her for her career. You know, I, I what I tell a lot of young people is the first job you take is not the most important decision you're going to make. You know, just to get a job that in, that interests you, that that excites you, and and then figure out what else you, what what you like and what you don't like, and then you'll get that next job and the next job. So I think sometimes when you come out of college, we're so focused on oh my gosh, I have to make this decision is the most important decision I'll ever make, and it's really not. Just get a job that's going to interest you, that's that you think you're going to like, and then just sort of figure it out from there. Yeah, build build off of that experience, right? Because exactly, regardless of what you do, you're going to learn things. That's and, right. And one of the things you may learn is that, boy, I really love doing this. Or you may learn, boy, I really don't like doing this. Like, like you said, you, you decide, you, you learn that you don't like working from home, right? right? You like sort of the office environment, the more interaction, interactive stuff. That's important stuff to learn. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Ap- uh, wonderful. So after Procter and Gamble, uh, wh- what'd you do after that? So that's when I sort of fell into the hotel business. So I actually had a, um, a neighbor that was uh, had been in the hospitality business forever, and she was actually my mother's friend, and she knew I had had sales experience, and so she actually contacted me and said, you know, I, we're uh, I'm I'm opening this this hotel. It's a new brand. It's called Resident Inn. There's only like ten of them, and it's a new concept. And I need a salesperson, and I really would like you to consider it. And, and, you know, here I'd gone from this really big company, Procter & Gamble, to now this sort of startup business that only had 10 hotels. Uh, And it was, I was thinking, I really got, I had to really think hard about it. But but the more I, actually what happened is my boss at Procter & Gamble laid out all the reasons why it was a bad idea. And that kind of made me mad, to be honest. And so um, I I actually did a lot of soul searching and said, I'm just going to try this. And so, you know, the rest is history. Uh, Marriott did not own the brand at the time. They bought it later. Um, But it was such a great learning experience. And I learned that I loved hospitality. Yeah, yeah. So if you're in sales, so I'm naive about the hospitality business. So you're, you're hired by the person who sort of started the residence in brand? And you're in sales. So what does that what does that job entail? So I actually was selling for a hotel. So we were opening a hotel um, in Overland Park, Kansas, and basically it was going out to businesses in the in the vicinity and talking about we're a new kind of hotel. We're focusing on extended stay, people that might be relocating, and it was really just educating them on what the hotel was about and trying to convince them to sign um, contracts with us, special rate contracts with us, so all of their employees would stay at our hotel. So that was really it was it was as much educating as it was convincing them to use our product. Got it. Got it. Very nice. And uh, you were there for how long? Gosh, I I was only there for about maybe 18 months. And then uh, at the time, the the owner of the hotel wanted to um, build more and start their own management company. So that's when I joined their small business. It was a small business. Uh, They only had that one hotel, but they wanted to build more. And so I joined them and uh, as head of marketing and sales, hiring all the salespeople, um, working on the marketing strategies for their company. Oh. And when I was there, I think we started with one hotel. By the time I left, it was about we had about seven. Oh wow! So you were you were there for a, a nice growth spurt uh, in 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 that business. That's right. And were they all in the sort of Kansas area? Yeah. So actually, interesting story. So it was uh, Dick and Lou Weens, uh, or the brothers, actually cousins, that started the business. And Dick had made all of his money in the from the oil business, and he wanted to diversify. And so um, they were actually from uh, you know from my hometown of Hutchinson, Kansas, which you know I didn't know them. They didn't know my family, but it was just coincidental. And so um, yeah. So they and they're still in in the business today. They are still franchise partners today. So I still. Um, come upon them in my current role uh, now in a different way as as their owners, but um, they're meaningfully engaged with Marriott still today. Oh, wonderful, wonderful! Uh, you mentioned franchises. So, is the uh, is the Marriott model? These are all independently owned uh, hotels, and it's a franchise model. 
Yeah, so a lot of people don't know that about Marriott. So um, especially with my brand, I would say 90% of the hotels are, are franchise owned and managed. Marriott doesn't own any of the real estate. We, we make money in two ways, from franchise fees and from management fees. And we tend to manage um, more of the full service hotels than the select service hotels, the space I'm in. So yes, we are working with small business owners largely that are franchisees of our brands as well as um, other of our competitor brands. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of, uh, can we talk about franchises for a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, franchises out there and, and oftentimes people consider getting a franchise and, and sort of, you know, working in that space. What would some of your words of wisdom be for someone who's considering buying a franchise? Well, do your research, uh, talk to other people that are um, actually have bought into the, the franchise. You know, in our world, we don't um, we we actually don't take anybody who raises their hand to say, I'd like to be a franchisee. We, we go through a process of vetting and making sure that they'll be successful, frankly. So, you know, understand that process too. understand what it, what you need to, to demonstrate to be able to to be selected to be a franchisee in, in, in the case of, of our brands. And then, you know, you really do want to make sure you've got the financials lined up. I mean, I think that's it's always takes more money than you think it's going to take to really get into a, a business, a franchise business and sustain it. And, you know, I think my learning from at least from the hotel side of things is that it's about three years, as you said, like a career before your business. You need to have financial backing for three years to be able to support the business before it sort of is it's um, cranking on its own. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you said uh, in the Marriott case, one of the things that you provide are, are management services. What are what are some of the things that that uh, you guys provide? So it's there's two models. So if if you buy if you buy a franchise um, uh, and and you say I I want to manage it myself, I, I've got a, a infrastructure that I can manage myself. We call that owner operated. All right. So if you, but if you buy a franchise and you say uh, I'm new to the hotel business, Marriott, I'd really like you to manage it. Then we actually do everything. We put the staff in. You know, we pay the staff, and you pay us a fee to manage your hotel. So as I said, we make money in two ways: by franchise fees and if you decide to manage on your own great or we might you might be paying us a franchise fee and a management fee oh, if, if we manage for you got it got it very nice so let's go back to brands uh, yes and uh so you manage several different um uh, brands um and uh what are sort of some of the common elements across those brands so the seven brands that I look after, we call the category classic select. And basically the common elements are these are sort of what I would call, not to get into my lingo too much, mid-tier brands, more um, you know, uh, affordable brands than like a luxury brand, as you would, that are in the select space. So, so what we mean by that is it's not full service. It's, it's more... Um, um, it, it's all the services you need is what we like to say, but not the things that you don't need. Right. So um, and that's what all the brands that I look after have in common. So um, we talk about when we talk about classic select, we've got classic brands and distinctive select. There's 10 total um, and classic select brands are, would be more approachable, a little bit more, um, um, you know, um, a little bit more approachable where, and, and a little bit more. Um, well, let me explain distinctive. Distinctive select brands would be a little bit more trendy, a little bit more polarizing, right? So Moxie is a brand that we just stood up that is very, um, very trendy and very much about, you know, the bar. And in fact, you check in at the bar and that's more in that distinctive brand category. Whereas my brands, I would say more approachable, more um, what what you would expect for from a for business travel and, and not not polarizing. Yes. Yes. So how do you sort of, uh, think about brand? In other words, you, you, you have this, you have this brand category and 
what drives that? In other words, what drives the decisions you make? I mean, do you look at demographics and say what people want and then you decide what to do or is it the other way around or, or talk about that a little bit? Good question. Yeah. So in Marriott, we do a whole lot of consumer research. And so I'll take my, my Courtyard brand, for instance. It was really um, the first brand in the industry that that, that came into this space, um, this, this moderate tier space for business travelers. And so in doing that, we did a lot of research. We did a lot of talking to consumers consumers to say, what do you want? What What isn't in the market that you really need? And so we've really been grounded in that from the get-go with Marriott. So as we develop new brands, we do a lot of customer research to find out what's missing, what do they need, and how can we put a new brand in place that will meet those needs? So that's how we think about it. The other thing we think about a lot, and, and each of my brands, while we're, my brands are in a, a category, they each have a distinct personality too. And we talk a lot about, you know, if, if you think your brand is your product and service only, then you're really, uh, you're really just a commodity. You, your brand has to be a promise, right? And that's the difference is you, you need to make sure you understand that it's the emotional uh, part that uh, of the brand that 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 um, there's an emotional payoff for the consumer, and that's what we really try to focus on. What is that promise to the customer beyond what we're what our product and service? Right, right. And I I remember when Courtyard came out, it was it was sort of a brand new concept, a very targeted at sort of business travelers, and and now there's a a fair number of those types of uh, products that sort of serve that marketplace, that sort of have a similar type of look and feel to them. So how do you sort of differentiate? How do you think about brand differentiation within a segment? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, we, you know, you're right. Courtyard was one of the first in, and then we had a lot of folks that that followed us. Um, and so what, what we've had to do is reinvent ourselves along the way. So Courtyard actually, there was a period when I actually was brought in to lead the brand where Courtyard was really, uh, really behind. And we were, we had not um, innovated enough in the, in the space. And we had to take a step back and say, okay, what are competitors doing? And where are we missing the mark? For instance, we didn't have any evening food and beverage that was consistent and the the consumer was evolving to to really want to be in public spaces like Starbucks right that that was all the rage so um, sort of that public private uh, opportunity and so we went through a huge transformation where frankly in uh, over seven years every hotel had to spend around a million dollars to totally transform their lobby and put in what we call the bistro, which are, is our new fast casual dining concept. But once we did that, our results and our competitive, our, our ability to compete in the marketplace um, increased significantly. So, uh, you know, I, all that to say, I think for any brand that is sort of first in or an older brand, you have to really continually reinvent yourself. Yeah. And, and, uh, what uh, what type of uh, where do you get that that data from? Right, I mean, there's there's being observational, like you said, you know, just kind of looking around at what other competitors are doing. But do you guys do like focus groups and invite people in and and do some of that more sort of uh, hands on type of uh, data gathering. Yeah, first of all, the data we would look at is just our business results, right? So we have something we call market share, where you have a, a set of competitors that you compare yourself to. And certainly you want to be better than 100% share, right? And so Courtyard had always been in about the 120 as a brand, right? Every hotel's different, but about 120% of its share. But then we were significant every year that was declining. So I think when we started the transformation, we were down to maybe 113% uh, percent for, of our share. So we'd lost a lot. So uh, so that was the first thing that we had knew we had a problem, that our competitors were beating us. But then, yes, we did a lot of consumer research. And, and we actually hired a company called IDEO. Um, out of San Francisco, and we did a lot of focus groups, and then we actually built um, a model lobby that was no color, just out of cardboard, white, to actually take consumers through to actually, um, you know, interact with the space and give us feedback. And we did it purposely in a very, you know, plain way because people react to color in different ways, and it was really more functional that we wanted to to get feedback on. And that's really how our our new lobby concept was born. Yes. And, and so how do you deal with sort of uh, regional and cultural differences across, a, you know, a brand like Courtyard, right? Yeah. 
You know, that's a great question. You know, when we first launched the bistro, there was a lot of pushback around, well, we need to have some regional items. And, you know, in the South, you need grits and, you know, for breakfast. And and so we were very, um, we were very linear. We, we, we were very prescriptive, I would say, when we first launched, launched the concept. Because if you look at McDonald's, there are a few regional nuances, but really it's very much the same. And when you're in a franchise model and when you're also in a, um, again, a brand is a promise, right? So so you've got to make sure that it's consistent. And so we were very prescriptive when we first launched the Bistro. So, um, and, it, and while some folks said this will never work, it, it largely did. Uh, now we have taken a step back as we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated and um, uh, and a little bit more, um, we, we know that the, the operators of the hotels know more what they're doing. They're, they've been doing it for a while now. We are allowing for some regional nuances, but it's very, we, we give them the recipes. We give them the, the direction. It's not like, okay, just do whatever you want, right? So we have some regionalization, but largely, it, I would say 90% of what we do is, um, is is prescriptive in the same because that's that is how you ensure that you your brand promise is consistent across the enterprise. Yes, and is is the is the uh, courtyard is that just a, a, a domestic or North American? Uh, no, it's global. So global. it's global so now. Definitely courtyard. If you went to a courtyard in in China, it's it's going to feel completely different. If you go to a courtyard in Europe, it's going to be different. So, and yes, I've done a lot of, of you know, my job has me traveling about had me traveling about fifty percent of the time before this crazy crisis, um, and to to all over the world to actually figure out how to grow our brand. Spearfield is another example. Um, we're launching that brand um, in Asia, and it's it's on fire right now. And so, but definitely feels different over there. Things are more elevated over there. Um, you, you know, we we laugh and call our courtyards over there the the JW Marriott courtyards or the the Ritz Carlton courtyards because they feel much more elevated than what we have in the United States. But that's what the competitive set is too. So we definitely have adapted the brands um, that are global, and there are several of mine that are. Um, to be appropriate to the the parts of the, the world that they're in. Yeah, yeah. So that's really interesting. And uh, as you, because one of the one of the good things about sort of the economy these days is, is that it's pretty easy uh, to sell and ship your product across the world these days, right? Compared to 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but the challenge is these cultural differences from Japan to England to the United States to, you know, New England to Southern United States. And, and so how do you sort of think about those cultural differences, both in terms of not just the physical property uh, and not just the services, but sort of um, f- the people that you hire and, 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 you know, a much broader sort of set of cultural differences that, that impact and even communications, right? You have to think about your brochures, Right. The, the the wording in those things may not be appropriate for where you are. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we have teams out in each of the continents. Right. So we have experts in each of the continents that we collaborate with. So I'll give the example of a recent um, ad campaign that we that we launched for Courtyard. And it was a global campaign, but we had to work with our, our region or our continent um, counterparts to make sure that um, that how they then translated it. And I don't mean literally translated it, but how the, the, the message, the core of the message was still the same, but some of the um, th- there were nuances because of the cultural differences. So I think it's really important that you have experts in the various continents that that can then take what we sort of uh, come up with at center, I like to say, and and then help um, take it and translate it not only literally but culturally to be relevant for that market that that part of the world. Yeah, yeah. So. When you think about brand at sort of the the forty thousand foot level, what are you? What are some of the important characteristics of building a brand? Well, you know, again, I go back to a brand being a promise, right? And it's really important that you know that you you think about you know what is it about your brand that is going to create sort of raving fans. 
Um, because what you want at the end of the day is you want brand loyalty, right? And so whether you're a big company or a small company, you know, you know, a strong and effective brand really should, you know, ev evoke emotion. It should inspire you to feel connected um, to to that business. And I'll give an example. I just, just since I've moved back to Arizona, I needed to find a dentist. Now, you don't think of a dentist as a brand, right? And frankly, you don't think of a dentist as as some something that you're going to feel this emotional connection to. People largely don't like going to the dentist, right? So I called up the dentist that I had gone to before and I said, you know, do you still have my records? And they're like, of course we still have your records. And in fact, we still have the same hygienist that did your cleaning the last time. Would you like an appointment with her? And I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. So then I get in there and you'd think I'm like this long lost sister that they, and I don't remember these people, but whether they remembered me or not, they made me feel like I was, they were so excited to have me back. And she re even reminded me that we had the same birthday. And so it's just an example where, you know, I like, I'm so, so I feel so connected. It was, I felt so good, right, about going to the dentist. And like, like, that's an example of a connection. And it's, they're simple. They're really not hard. But, but I will be loyal to that dentist. And I will recommend that dentist because of that experience that I just had a couple of weeks ago. So that's what brands need to do. They need to figure out, you know, how to connect with a customer. And it's usually through their people, right? A lot of it is through their people or their marketing, right? If you think of, um, you know, Starbucks, Nike, I think some those are two brands that I think do a great job of connecting. My daughter, who's 20 and in college, I mentioned, she, I said to her the other day, why do you like Starbucks so much? And she said, well, you know, I, I, you know, they've been communicating with me all through this COVID, just kind of checking in and, and making sure I'm okay. And it's, it's not a one-on-one -on -one communication, but she feels like it is, right? So that's what I think brands need to do is they need to figure out how to really connect. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great uh, set of, op, of uh, suggestions there. So as, a, as an organization grows, with, with branding being so important, and, and, I, and I really like the dentist example, um, as an organization grows, <clears throat> how do you ensure that that consistency of, of experience for the customer is maintained? Well, I think, I think that the most important thing is you've got to hire the right people. You've got to make sure that um, that you give them the right training and the right um, information to be able to um, serve the c customer. Uh, and I, I think that you have to continually give them coaching on, on what's working and what's not working and make them feel a part of it. Right. I think that's really important. That's what I observed at the dentist. You know, the, the people stay around for a long time if they like the workplace that they're in and they feel that they're valued. They're getting paid, compensated uh, fairly and all of that. And so for the you know, if, if you have a lot of turnover, you've probably got a problem. You're, you're not going to be successful long term um, with your business. So you have to figure that out first. So it really, to me, starts with the people that you hire and, and the culture that you create and the, the training that you give people and from there um you know it can get it can get more complicated but i would i would hesitate i i would um warn people not to make it more complicated than you need to yeah yeah so speaking of hiring uh what are what attributes do you look for when you're when you're thinking about bringing someone on board so I'll go back to my time. I'll think more when I was managing hotels. So before I got to headquarters, I was um, I was uh, full service general manager for Marriott for for years. And you know the first thing I looked for is people that genuinely smiled and were friendly. Because if if you're not generally uh, smiling and friendly, you're you're never going to be successful in in a, a customer service business. Um, that really was it. I can teach people to do a lot of different things, but if I don't have just a genuine um, uh, kind of personality that has me liking people, that's that's number one. So the other thing is somebody who's curious, somebody who's open, willing to do, you know, and really wants to grow. I think those are the other attributes that that I look for, no matter if you're hiring a, a housekeeper or a front desk associate, right? So um, those would be where I would start. And from there, we can train people. Yeah, 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 that's good. I, I've, uh, I've heard that advice of sort of hiring personality or attitude, whatever the right adjective there is, is the number one key important element and most other things you can train people for. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And 
I still go back to sort of this notion of uh, consistency. So how do you sort of maintain that high level of service as time goes on, right? Because you may, I, you may hire me, you may bring me on, you train me, but I need a booster shot on occasion. And, right. and how do you think about that? So what we did at the ho- in the hotels is we had um, guest sur- surveys. So uh, we would get guest surveys back daily. And so, you know, we what I did as a leader is I made sure that I shared that information with everybody and everybody knew we had a certain goal, a shared goal to be at a certain level of our, of our service. And so we measured our success through these guest surveys and through our guest so basically, it's making sure that you communicate what the goal is, that you are sharing uh, the the information with the, the associates along the way. And then we would have little incentive programs, too. You know, if, if somebody got a great comment um, in, a, in a comment card or in a survey, we would uh, reward them. And so uh, I think it's creating a culture where you, again, you, you set the goal, you communicate the goal broadly, you measure it, and then you incent people along the way. And that's how you get sort of a shared um, understanding and, and this shared um, uh, sort of this this culture, shared culture of making sure that we're excellent. We also do something in Marriott that most franchise companies do, which is we do also have a, an annual um, uh, audit. We actually do an, an annual quality assurance audit, and it tests both, you know, just some, some of the basic product product expectations, but also service expectations. So that's another way that we sort of ensure consistency across the enterprise. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, small growing companies often often struggle with um, is pricing and trying to understand how they price their product or service within the marketplace. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you guys, how do you think about that? You know, that's, that's, uh, it's gotten very scientific over time, right? Revenue management has become quite the science for, for us. Just if you look at airplanes and some of the other businesses that do that price uh, based on demand, but, but we do look at our competitors. We, we look largely at our competitors and, you know, what are they pricing uh, at and where do we think we should be vis-a-vis sort of our, our comp set, but also those that might be above us or below us, right? You have to look at more of a luxury product that's something that should be priced at a higher price and then more of a value product, something that should be at a lower price. And so how do you fit in between there too? Because again, in Marriott, we have 30 brands. So we've got luxury brands and we've got, you know, my brands and, and uh, that are more on the on the the, the middle so um, it's really around looking at the, the overall marketplace and your competitors and, and how people are pricing yeah and uh, when you have 30 brands in a, in, a, in, a, in an organization uh, how do you so when companies have multiple brands how do you sort of keep those brands separate and sort of prevent confusion in the marketplace of yeah. you know brand a versus brand B it's hard. It's it's not easy, and it's very nuanced. To be be honest, um, we talk a lot about brand swim lanes and making sure we're trying to keep our brands within their swim lanes. And I actually actually uh, led a body of work when we bought Starwood. We before we bought Starwood, we didn't have thirty brands, but when we purchased Starwood three years ago now, I led a body of work to uh, try to to articulate better the the, the swim lanes. And, and you think about it, we actually bought some of competing brands. Right. We bought four points, which is now in my um, group, and it was a direct competitor to Courtyard. So we've had to really talk about, okay, what makes them different and how do we have proof points um, that are different for each of the brands and how do we communicate those to customers? So, um, you know, it's it's I wouldn't say we've got it. We've got it all figured out, but it's certainly something we've been working hard to to to. uh, further define and, uh, and get out into the marketplace. Yeah. So let, let's say I, I'm an entrepreneur and I, and I, and I have a brand, I have a, I have a company, I have have a brand, I have a promise, uh, and, uh, I want to change it. I want to move into a different segment. So what are some of the things I should be doing? I should be thinking about, and, uh, what does that process look like? How long does it take? So that's, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, again, I think it needs to start with, if you want to move into a different area, you need to do your research. You need to find out, you know, is there, is there 
business to be had in that area or not, right? Is is it a good idea to diversify or to, to go into a different area? So first make sure that there's demand for whatever product service you're, you're trying to stand up. Then secondly, go out and talk to people, right? Do some research, talk about, you know, what, what, what's out there, what, what, what's missing and try to, to design your business to, to fit a, a niche. And then of course you need to make sure you're hiring somebody to help you articulate what the brand is on a website, um, whether, you know, blogs, um, your LinkedIn page, you know, all of that, you need to make sure that you're representing the brand in a, in the, in all the channels that you should be so you can get, get it out there. So it's interesting. My husband is actually an entrepreneur and he's actually just done that himself where he's trying to pivot to, into a, um, a, a different segment that he's looking to, um, he's a leadership strategist. So he's looking at, um, looking at retirees and, and looking at their next act of life. And so he He's recently gone through this process. And so it's been interesting to see sort of how he, he went about it. And now we've had to pivot again because with the change with COVID and all of that, you know, that's not necessarily a, a pe- where people are going to be spending their their money right now. So I think you have to also have some backup plans. Yeah. You should, you know, I wouldn't say if you've got a successful business today um, and you want to pivot to another business, don't give up the successful business before it uh, totally to stand up the new business. Can you do both? Can you stand up a new business while you're still focusing on the successful business? Yeah, yeah, it's a transition. And and how long does a does a pivot a brand pivot take? How, and when I think about that, is that something I should say? Okay, this is going to be a three year process for me, or is it is it shorter? I think it depends. It depends on how much you're, if you're, if you're still in the same general um, sort of area of expertise, it probably doesn't take quite as, uh, as long as if you're totally changing. Let's say if you're going from owning a hotel to owning a restaurant or from owning a hotel to starting up a dry cleaner. I mean, you know, I think it's different. It depends on how you're pivoting and if you're totally going into a different business versus just, um, uh, a nuance of, of sort of what you're already doing, but you're just expanding it to different audiences. Yeah. Yeah. And when you think about a brand, you know, it, uh, 30 years ago, uh, there was only a few places to advertise. <laughs> there was a few outlets that you had to deal with. Now there's this plethora of places where you have yeah. to be, you yeah. have no choice. You have to be there. So how do you sort of think about that and how do you manage that and prioritize that? Yeah. So we think about uh, think about it in terms of a funnel, right? So we think about the, the inverted funnel, like a upside down triangle. And the top of the funnel is really what we would call broad inspiration. That is where you would be, you know, on TV and sort of mass media, all of that, if you can afford it, right? Um, and even local, locally, I see commercials on, on TV that are clearly local, but getting the word out. Then you get into that middle part of the funnel, which is what we call consideration. This is where people now are starting to sort of kind of look around and consider your product. And that's where you need to be in, you know, on uh, your, your website, your social media, you know, all of the, your, your public relations efforts, all those things that sort of get people interested, right? So interested in your brand. And then we talk about booking. And that also is, you know, is very much a digital experience in a lot of cases um, or by phone. But it, how, it's a different kind of communication, a call to action to book. So that may be where you give your promotion offers or something of that nature. But you really should be, if you can, in all parts of the funnel. You really should have, you know, your efforts in all parts of the funnel. And certainly, you know, it, it's gotten so sophisticated today with your social media and your, um, and, but I do think sometimes what, one of the things we have learned is don't be on social media just to be on it. You need to have something to say, right? Because people today, they, they see through that, you know, they just, the numbers of impressions are not necessarily how you're going to win in the, in the, um, social media side of things. It really needs to be, um, you need to make sure you've got a, a thoughtful, approach to social media because it can it it can actually backfire on you yeah yeah well said well said janice so janice we've been at this uh, almost 40 minutes uh i want to respect your time is there anything uh that i should have asked you that i haven't great question no i think you've covered the gamut this has been a fun conversation well well thank you very much you've been a great guest i've really uh, enjoyed having this conversation and and you sharing your expertise uh, about brands thank you very much for being on the show 
It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Bela, it's kind of the, the, I think, I don't know, we could call this the episode to bring up things that we've neglected a little bit, right? Over the last, what has it been? Almost two years, right? Um, almost 100 episodes. And I think branding, we haven't talked enough about. I think it's really important. And franchising, um, we've kind of ignored. And I think that's actually par for the course for a lot of people like us who spent a lot of time in academics. Um, franchises are kind of looked down upon, I think, as a way uh, for entrepreneurs to uh, to gain experience, create wealth, to accomplish their goals. Um, but I, according to my one of my favorite sources, Statista, um, there's almost, this is all about eights, Bella. Eight is the magic number. 800,000 franchise establishments just in the U.S. And these franchise establishments in the U.S. employ about 8 million people. And they bring in about 800 billion with a B in revenue every year. It's a big part of the economy. Okay. So I think it's worth talking about franchising for a few minutes and it's worth talking about branding for a few minutes. Let's start with franchising. What do you see are the pros and cons of franchising from the perspective of an entrepreneur? Yeah. So I, I think, uh, franchises are interesting. Um, you know, you, you are basically committing yourself to this, uh, company whether it, whatever the franchise is, whether it be a hotel like Marriott or whether it be a McDonald's franchise or some other franchise that, that you, I haven't a heard. car dealership, right? Car that dealership. I was a part owner of, right? That was a franchise business. That's right. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are franchises that we don't realize, right? As you mentioned with your data there, it's a, it's a big industry. So I think the good news is that it gives you a structure it gives you, it gives you, you become an operating person. You are operating that business within a structure and a set of guidelines that the, the franchisor uh, is, or the, the big company, right? The mothership is, is setting up for you. Uh, and I think that can be very helpful, right? Because they, they can do national advertising, right? So you're not, you, you, you're part of a Ford dealership, right? It, it's, you, you go from not owning a business to owning a Ford dealership or a McDonald's, and all of a sudden people know exactly what that is, what, you're, what you are, right? So you have that advantage of the brand, so to speak, right? So these things are related. You have that, you have that instant brand. Um, so that's really good. And I think, and, 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 yeah, but you, but you, you also have to remember that you have to work within a set of guidelines or rules and regulations that the franchise or, again, the mothership has set up for you, right? And sometimes you have to purchase certain things from from the mothership. So, for example, if you own a, a, a McDonald's or any of these fast food franchises, you you have to buy the 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 french fries the raw french fries from mcdonald's you have to buy the straws from mcdonald's you have to buy the cups from mcdonald's you have to buy all those things so oftentimes you don't the soft oh, sorry the software right, the, that you run yes. right that the, all the it usually is bought from the franchisor or at least through somebody that the franchisor has selected and gets a, a kickback that's right the, the whole the whole thing getting the place built if you're building a new one right etc the floors the cabinets they give you this list here's what you here's what your choices are Right. So, so you don't have the, 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 the challenge may be you don't have a lot of control over that. You don't have a lot of input to, uh, to it. And it sort of, it sort of defines your cost structure. The good news is that all that stuff is taken care of for you, right? You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to, oh my God, I got, I got to go figure out how to build a building. I got to figure out how to buy off. this equipment, right? Yeah. It, it's all sort of taken care of for you. And the other interesting thing is there's a lot of other franchise ease people like yourself in the business so you should really be able to do a great cost analysis of the operating margins in a business like that and have a good understanding for what volumes you need to achieve in order to have a profitable business because you it you you have all these other other institution other companies like yourself other franchisees who are operating businesses and and the mothership should have that information and data for you because they should be collecting it and they probably are and they should hopefully share it with you because you can figure out whether what your probabilities are what what metrics you need to meet in order to have a profitable business 
So I think there's good, there's advantages and disadvantages to, to franchises. They're great ways to, to get into business. Uh, if you, if you sort of get involved with a, an up and coming franchise at the right period of time, you can often get in for, for a small amount of money because all of these franchises have a franchise fee. So there's sort of a buy-in on your part. You have to pay them a fee. Uh, and in return, you get certain goods and services for that. Uh, and it, it, so that fee oftentimes when a, when a, a new franchise is beginning are low and as the value of the franchise goes up, those fees go up, uh, cause that's one of the ways the, the franchise or makes money. Uh, so you can some, and you can sell them. Oftentimes you can sell a franchise. So it's sort of a way of investing your business. And if it's a successful franchise, I mean, people who, who opened McDonald's, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. They, they sold them 20 years later for a lot of money. Um, and and now so the franchisee it, has to approve. So that's right. In this. You can't sell it to anybody you want. That's right. That's right. So there's 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 a lot of uh, ifs, ands or buts mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in these agreements. And and usually the franchise, the franchise or has all sorts of controls in place. So you got to make sure they're balanced and. And here in the United States, there's actually a lot of regulations about franchising. So it's it's a regulated business from that perspective, both at the federal level and at the state level uh, at some states. So so there's some protections there because there has been some abuses in the past. Um, but I think it's a very viable way to go. Uh, and it's, it's something that, uh, again, you become an operating person. You're operating a business. And, and you're getting a certain percentage of that revenue. That's a way of looking. That's the most fundamental way of looking at it, right? I'm coming in, I'm an operator, uh, and I'm operating it, and I'm getting a certain percentage of the revenue. Yep. It's not good for people that want to be super innovative and are really creative because you cannot, in most cases, do your own advertising. You cannot, for example, in the fast food business, come up with your own menu items. You cannot, you don't even have control over pricing. Right. There's a range that you have to fall into. Um, so it's it's a good thing to remember if you really want to experiment and you want to develop your own kind of products and services that a franchise might not be the right choice for you. All right. But it, it, but it, it, but it's a wonderful way to get into business fast. Mm -hmm. Right. If you want to you want to. Hey, I want to open a business and. Boom. And whether it be in hospitality or food service or a whole bunch of options here, car dealerships, there's all sorts of opportunities. And it's a it's a it's a way of you to sort of step in, uh, assuming you meet their criteria. Right. Because the the, yeah, the mothership's got right. The mothership's going to have some criteria uh, in order to to take you in. Um, so it's uh, some of them work really, really well. Uh, there have been some disasters in the past, but I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some have worked really well. It's yeah, certainly a very yeah, very viable, uh, very viable business model. But do your homework and need to talk to a wide range of people who hold franchises in your area. Because here's the thing, you know, a lot of times they um, divide the country up into regions and you'll have a regional person that you'll work with. And that person may be great, but that person may leave and somebody in another region may take over and they're difficult to work with. So, you know, you got to keep in mind that the franchise or the mothership, they're a business too. Um, and so you really have to investigate uh, to make sure it's a good fit for you. And also the, the ability to exit is really important. What are the conditions for getting out, right? Because some are, are very constrained and therefore your investment might not be so liquid uh, as if you were doing it on your own. So yeah, there's lots of good books. There's people at the, you know, at the state and regional uh, small business associations that can help you with these. Uh, there's lots of coaches available to help with with franchisee uh, with franchising. Um, so yeah, I totally agree, Bela, that it, it has a lot of good things about it. Uh, again, helping to start um, start and, and and learn how to run a business, how to operate a business. But there's a lot of weaknesses too, and you got to go in like anything with your eyes wide open. Do your yeah. homework. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Mike, there was two other things that Janice and I talked about that mm -hmm. I, I, I think you and I should bat around a little bit. Uh, one is branding and the importance of branding. And, and the other one was, was hiring employees and mm -hmm. cultural differences, you know, across uh, geographic areas. Uh, and uh, so let's talk about branding first. 
Um, what are what are your sort of thoughts on brand? Oh, be, be, I think one of the things that I wanted to say was what what she said about branding. But that branding is the promise to your customer. That's how she defined branding. That your brand represents your promise to your customer. And I, and I never heard that before. And I thought it was an interesting way of articulating it. So what are your thoughts about branding, Mike? I love it. You know, I think entrepreneurs a lot of times tend to miss branding, right? That they that they just think I'm going to slap my name on on this this company and and there we go, right? Um, and didn't don't, don't always think about how they're going to interact every time with the customer. I mean, her story about the dentist office I thought was great, right? In terms of you know, and I I've been to the dentist, I I, I and I've had the same experience, like. There's no way. I know they've got a really good CRM, customer relationship management system that that does all these things. It's it's all technology. But the fact is, is that when I walk in the door, they're like, hi, Mr. Wasserman. I don't need to say, hi, I'm Mike Wasserman. And oh, and they're like, oh, we know you're here for a cleaning. And, you know, this is what happened last time. And this is what we're going to do. And, you know, how's your wife? And how are things going at the university? And I know, well, OK, one of the the dental people I know. actually that's not totally true but in the beginning this was all technology driven but they made me feel welcome and they made me feel comfortable and I totally have, a, have had a similar uh, story to, to Janice and I think it's great and it is it's it's a brand the that whether any kind of service business should be a brand a product that you affiliate with you know I I buy this this kind of clothes I'm a huge like I have these Contigo coffee mugs right I'm like a huge fan of these and the brand means something to me it's a brand promise that when I put my coffee in this Contigo traffic probably shouldn't say the name of the company we're gonna get in trouble but when I put it in the coffee cup it stays hot and it doesn't spill I'm very messy everybody who knows me knows I'm very messy I spill <laughs> things and you know these cups don't do anything the brand has a promise to me and whether it's a dentist or a coffee mug or a car company or a, a brand of jeans, um, we all love to have relationships with brands and entrepreneurs need to figure that out. And what's that connection going to be? And it really needs to be, it'll evolve over time, I guarantee you. But you need when you're starting out to have this conception of what does my brand, what's it going to stand for? What's it going to mean? How am I going to show that promise every single day, every time a customer walks in that door or calls me up on the internet or on the phone, right? That, that, that sees me on Instagram. How am I going to get this consistently across? And we're going to talk about hiring in a minute because I think that's key. But those are kind of my thoughts on this, that this really needs to be in the front of mind of every entrepreneur, whether it's B2C or B2B or e-commerce, right? Brand needs to be a critical piece of the pie. It's how you differentiate. We've talked a lot over the last couple of years about differentiating and standing out. And one of the ways you, you, that everybody can control, right? Sometimes the product you sell, you have no control over, but everybody has control over their brand and what it means to their customers. So I couldn't agree more, Bela, and I, now I'm ranting, but what do you think? Yeah, I, I think brand is really important and it should be a conscious decision that entrepreneurs make. And what I mean by that is you need to be proactive about it and you need to define it. You need to define it for yourself. You need to define it for your employees. You need to define it for your customers. And you need to, to constantly define it and make it out in the forefront. That's what I mean by conscious. An unconscious decision is one that just sort of happens outside of your control. And I think oftentimes, as entrepreneurs, we get so wound up in, in designing the product uh, or figuring out how we're going to market this or, or how we're going to promote it. Uh, we sort of lose sight of the brand. And, you know, there's great examples out there in the world of these coveted brands that have done a superb job at it. And oftentimes when you do a superb job at your brand, you can then move away from, here's one of my pet peeves, you can move away from competing on price. And all of a sudden, price becomes less important in the customer buying decision. And as price becomes less important, it gives you the opportunity to make greater margins and, and to do things with those margins, either improve your business, have more products, give to charity, whatever you want to do, right? Uh, so I, I think that's another good lesson to be learned from brands. If you look at all the premier brands, they typically charge premier prices, right? They're related. 
and you want to define your brand. You don't want to leave, you can get lucky and customers can define a brand for you, but I think it's much more successful. I think of a company like Allbirds that makes these really cool shoes out of wool from New Zealand or Warby Parker, the glasses company. Those companies actively had a very clear kind of guiding principle behind their brand and built the brand around those principles and communicated effectively. They didn't leave much space, right, for their customers to right. define the brand for them. Right? Yep. If you're it, weak with your brand statement, your customers will define it for you. Maybe it'll work, but maybe it'll be in ways that you don't want. Right. That's exactly what I mean by it should be a conscious decision, right? This should be a, a conscious thing that you do and spend time and energy and resources on it. So exceptionally important. Yeah. Now tie this into hiring because I think she, she really, I don't know if she made it as explicit as she could, but I really saw a connection between her philosophy on hiring and her philosophy toward branding, especially in the hospitality business that she's in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she, she said, she said something that, you know, she, she hires, uh, she hires employees based upon their sort of friendliness, their ability to interact with people, right? Their social skills, et cetera. Uh, because you think about in the hospitality industry, the, 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 the hotel industry to be specific as, as a hotel guest, you interact with all sorts of people in the hotel, right? There's the front desk, which is the obvious place, right? Where you interact with folks, but there's housekeeping that you're going to run into. Even if you're just passing them in the hallway, there are other, you know, service folks you're going to, you're going to run into. Uh, you, you might run into uh, various different other services that the hotel provides, whether it be the restaurant, et cetera. And that all represents the same brand. It all represents the same organization. And, and her philosophy, Janice's point was, I'm going to hire people who are friendly, engaging, listen, and, and uh, because that's sort of a person, her feeling was that's sort of a personality trait. Can, can I refine it? Absolutely. I can, I can tweak it, but I can't establish that baseline. It's very difficult. And, and the other everything skills. Everything else she can train. Everything, everything else right. she can train. Everything else she can train. And I'll tell you, the first time I heard someone say this, was years and years and years ago when I heard an interview with the person, the, 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 the HR person from Southwest Airlines. Mm -hmm. I was thinking and, the exact same thing. And, and, and I remember this, right? It was probably 20 years ago. I heard them say, we hire on personality, right? We hire on this friendly, outgoing personality. That's our number one characteristic. We can teach someone how to fly an airplane, right? We can teach someone how to fix an airplane. We can teach someone how to make a reservation. But this is an intrinsic characteristic that we look for, and it's really important. And it's related to your brand. Think about Southwest Airlines, right? They have this brand of being a fun airline, right? That's, that's their differentiator. In a, in a commodity, I'm going to fly you from point A to point B. That's their differentiator. So and brand has... Bela, but Bela, the flip side of that is really important too, because I think you, you know the story as well as I do. They don't worry about their shareholders first. They don't even worry about their customers first. They take care of their employees first because they know if they take care of their employees first. This was unheard of when Herb Kelleher kind of started this philosophy in the 70s, right? If you take care of your employees, they're going to take care of their customers. And if you take care of your customers, they're going to keep coming back and the shareholders are going to be happy. Right? Turn the dominant logic of business on its head. Right. Right. It's hard to have happy customers if your employees are pissed off. Mm -hmm. And boy, I can tell you, speaking of airlines, I've been on some airplanes where it was clear to me <laughs> that the employees of that airline were pissed off at the mothership, right? They were pissed off at their employer. And boy, did that come through. That vibrated through. And, I don't want to be in a toothpick, a toothpaste tube, you know, three miles up in the, in the air with people that are hostile, right? It just doesn't work for me. Right. I don't want to be anywhere. No. I don't care. I don't care if it's a, a, a you know, a, a, a store, right? right? A store or, uh, you know, wherever. So I think that's a good philosophy and this notion of sort of hiring people uh, based upon some intrinsic skills that are really important in your business, right? What's important in your business? And if you have an outfacing business where you're interacting with customers <coughs> and that's a predominant element of your business, man, 
the people in those jobs, you want to make sure that you're, you're selecting them based on characteristics that are important to you. Yeah. We all have bad days, Bela, but some of us have a lot more than others. And those are the ones we want to avoid. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, very good, Mike. Wrap this one up. Sure. I thought that was a very interesting interview and uh, just some takeaways, right? I think first, uh, this idea of branding is so critical. And I think um, for a big company, it's critical. And I think in some ways, it's even more important for an entrepreneur, for a small business to define your brand clearly, to use it as a point of differentiation, even when you're in a commodity business. So that's a huge takeaway. Uh, The second is this point about hiring, because how do you... uh, Transmit your brand, sure, Instagram is important and you know how, how your business looks on the web is important and your storefront, if you have one, is important. But at the end of the day, people are the ones that transmit this information and like it or not, your hiring is gonna go a long way towards um, every day um, that brand promise, that promise to your customers, they're the ones that are gonna be uh, doing the dirty work. So I think that's really important. And then the third thing is just kind of this idea of franchising as a as a method. She looked at it from the big company standpoint, and we talked about it at length from the, the franchisee standpoint. Um, so I think it was a great conversation. So listeners, hope you agree uh, and you enjoyed the last hour or so. Uh, if you have questions about what we discussed, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our email is bela.and.mike at gmail.com. Yeah, thanks for listening to this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, hey, please do hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcasting application. It's free. Hey, so until next week, signing off from upstate New York. This is Bela, and hey, Mike, have a great week. Thanks a lot, Bela. Great to talk with you, and look forward to next week's conversation. Until then, I think I'm off for a beer and a pretzel. <laughs>